Hi, Hi, and welcome to today's webinar titled Heightened Interest in LNG Stimulates Africa's Gas Economy. I'm Nicolette pombe Fansale, editor of ESI Africa and your moderator for today's discussion, hosted in collaboration with Future Energy Nigeria, which is taking place on the 12th and the 13th of November at Echo Hotel in Lagos, Nigeria. Joining me on air are four professionals who are ready to provide insight and answer your questions on the gas to power market. I'm pleased to welcome pra Pradita Mitra, based in Nigeria, Muzi Mkize from South Africa, and also from South Africa, Oldworth Mbalati, and joining us from the US, Mohamed Badisi. Listeners, please note that you will have access to the full recording after the broadcast on our website, esi-africa.com. To ask our guest a question, use the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. To find out more about Predipta, Muzi, Oldworth, Mohammed, and Future Energy Nigeria, or myself, toggle through the tabs at the top of your screen. For those of you just joining us, welcome. So now down to business. To get an idea of the market, our guest speakers have prepared an opening statement. Uh, listeners, just please bear in mind that we have a slight delay on the phone lines as everybody is dialing in from different locations in the world. So giving us an overview of the LNG market in West Africa, Pradipta, please take over the slides and give your opening statement. Hello, my name is Pradipta. Uh, I'm a market research specialist, and uh, I would like to take you, uh, give you a little, little bit of uh, knowledge on the LNG, liquefied natural gas market overview, uh, uh, particularly in focus in Nigeria and West Africa. Um, so I represent a company uh, called the Greenwood Liquefied Natural Gas Company Limited. Uh, uh, the company has, uh, currently has three trains producing LNG. Uh, one train is commercially active, and uh, so we are, we are already selling LNG to commercial and industrial customers. Now, I would like to first take you through the applications of LNG. Uh, LNG is used, as you are aware, uh, for automotive fueling, particularly uh, used as fuel uh, for your heavy-duty vehicles. Uh, trucks, uh, tippers, uh, and so on. Uh, it is also used uh, in power generation. Uh, but natural gas is used in power generation all over the world. Uh, and LNG is also used in power generation, particularly when the power plant happens to be located uh, off uh, any pipeline. Um, LNG is also used for heating uh, in industrial applications like boilers, kilns, and furnaces. Uh, uh, and it is also used in industrial and mining captive power, particularly mining uh, mines which are located uh, in remote areas um, where uh, the electricity grid uh, hardly reaches there and uh, there is no pipeline. So uh, LNG is used uh, in, uh, in large quantities in industrial and mining uh, captive power uh, industries. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, so you must be wondering then if it, there are no pipelines, then how, how do we send, how is LNG transported? Well, LNG is transported, uh, you know, through LNG tankers. Uh, a picture is given there. They are, these are cryogenic tanks, double world and vacuum, uh, uh, vacuum oriented, uh, insulated. Special steel material is it suitable to withstand. So LNG is transported at minus 162 degrees Celsius. So you can imagine um, it's really cold, uh, and it has to the the, the temperature has to be maintained. Um, the company has, for example, 300 trucks. So that's, that's a large fleet, uh, and these trucks also operate in uh, on on LNG as a fuel. Uh, two types of trucks. Uh, one is uh, 52 cubic meters, the other is 58 cubic meters, roughly 
21 metric tons and 24 metric tons respectively. Uh, the truck uh, can be offloaded at customer site uh, in three to four hours. Now, once uh, the the fuel tank of the truck itself is filled with uh, LNG, it can run, uh, it can travel over 1,000 kilometers without the need of refueling. And all these trucks are, of course, uh, uh, enabled with 24/7 GPS tracking system. So. Now, this is the concept of virtual pipeline. In other words, um, it's not an actual pipeline, but it's a virtual pipeline. You can imagine you know, a large fleet of these tankers going to remote areas, places. Uh, I am showing you a map of Nigeria, and you will see uh, the corner, north west corner, you have a place called Sokoto. Uh, then you have various cities everywhere, and you will see these small little yellow tankers going everywhere. It can reach various places. So, um, you know, it, that's why it's known as virtual pipeline. So, in other words, virtual pipeline has more flexibility to reach remote inaccessible areas than actual pipeline. And LNG is transported using uh, such a virtual uh, pipeline. Um, now, you know, we usually at customer sites, we were uh, commercial and industrial customers. You have storage tanks. Uh, the slide uh, pictures that show you the uh, vertical white color storage tanks, these are the LNG tanks. Um, and uh, the black element in front of that are the vaporizers, which changes LNG back to natural gas. Uh, and these are, uh, these are uh, in your uh, customer sites so, so that they have adequate storage. Um, so basically, this is how LNG uh, is being operated already in West Africa, and it will be extended to other countries very soon. And uh, the main challenges are basically poor road network and conditions, uh, and uh, you know all these equipments that you are seeing, uh, storage tanks, uh, regas equipments, they are all imported; they are not manufactured locally. So these are the main challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pradipta. Murthy, I believe you are covering infrastructure and developments on the regulatory framework. Please take over the slides and present your opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'll just go quickly go through the, the, the slides. Um, I'm coming from the point of view, just as part of the introduction, that Africa is the world's uh, fastest growing economy uh, with all these 54 countries causing a combined uh, gross domestic product forecast to grow by more than 4% per annum as compared to the globe's uh, 3%. And then um, you've got the population also increasing, uh, which is currently at 1.3 and is going to reach 1.7 billion people. Um, by, 20, by 2030. Also, we've got uh, consumption that has grown by 50% since 2000 and is forecast to increase further by uh, 60% uh, uh, going forward in 2030. Uh, uh, that on its own just points out to the fact that uh, there is a need for more energy with the growing population as well as the, the increasing uh, the, the, the economy uh, being uh, uh, like growing. At, at, at this rate. Then um, what all this says is that uh, uh, how then are we going to, to, to deal with these issues and looking at the challenges that we're facing? And for me is that uh, we need to all understand that energy also is part of the, the, the energy being, being a, 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 a one career in, in, the, in the whole uh, energy suite. Is that uh, energy is the lifeblood of any economy and an enabler as well as an input cost. So energy does not just exist for itself, but it exists to ensure that uh, it does save the social economic uh, imperative. And we need to look at the whole environment, uh, which is the political, economic, social, uh, technological environment, as well as the legal environment in the country, as well as in the globe, for sustainability and integration, and the issues of the need to, uh, to, for internet issues with other, with, 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 amongst the plan. So everything for me, I'll say, it starts with, good planning. 
and good planning, there are some key ways that will always accompany good plans, being, for example, the integratedness, being the uh, sustainability that, that is a, 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 like a, in the plan. And um, what is necessary is that there must be a national development uh, planning portion. In South Africa, for example, we've got a national development plan from which then other plans flow. That is informed by uh, defeating policy, legislative, and the environment that is then developed at a policy level. Then we've got laws that are passed by parliament, and then and then they then inform the the, the national uh, development plan. Then from that plan, we then have an integrated energy uh, plan, which will will uh, also deal with the infrastructure part. For example, in South Africa, we recently have an integrated uh, resource plan that was uh, approved by cabinet last month, which then talks to how the, the, the new generation of electricity is going to be uh, met by various uh, uh, sources. For example, there is wind, there is solar, there is uh, uh, gas, as well as uh, 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 some element of nuclear there. Um, and and, uh, and uh, with all of these, they then, we then can move to a, the specific energy carrier, which then talks to the energy carrier specific planning. Uh, and then for me, without the required infrastructure and human capital, all of that planning will actually be in vain because the planning must then also have the commiserate uh, uh, implementation of that particular plan. Uh, the challenges in growing uh, Africa's economy is lack of infrastructure to serve the citizens. Uh, most of the infrastructure is, is tailored towards having raw materials exported and not actually beneficiation and also not necessarily uh, 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 serving the citizens by and large. Um, so the, the, the challenges of infrastructure, I would say, for example, in Texas, when the, in the USA, the, with the development of shelters, it was uh, enabled and facilitated by the fact that there was already some pipeline infrastructure that was outlaid uh, in advance, uh, which enabled uh, uh, shelters to, to take off quicker. The challenge in Africa is the lack even of the backbone infrastructure to import as well as to 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 to, to export. There is also inadequate capacity in terms of in, uh, skills and experience to develop energy projects and manage operations once the project is 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 up and 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 and, and going. And then the other challenge is the lack of political will and citizens over the reliance on politicians. Um, the, the, uh, with that also uh, bureaucratic delays. Um, examples of thereof is like in Tanzania where we've got this uh, natural gas project there, which was is now expected to come post 2030 because of delays in getting the required uh, um, approvals. The same has happened in Ghana with an agreement with Norway, um, Norway's uh, company to provide a, a, a floating storage uh, recertification unit, um, which as was also delayed because of the, uh, delays in approvals. Uh, the other challenge is lack of policy and regulatory certainty. Uh, this gives rise to a situation which is also ripe for corruption, red tape, and also uh, investor repulsion. There's also weak and badly managed institutions uh, and state-owned companies. These actually are supposed to be the ones that enable any state to then be able to, to, to crowd in um, the private sector and get uh, the, the, the investments into the infrastructure uh, sector. And then there's uh, instability and sovereignty risk. That I link it with the shortage of capital. Um, in one study, it has uh, indicated that um, uh, no nation in sub Saharan Africa is rated investment grade. Uh, so countries with poor credit records then tend to rely on foreign. In, uh, investment and agencies like the World Bank to provide guarantees to build LNG import and, 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 and export fa uh, facilities. But I, I still maintain that um, uh, despite these challenges, uh, Africa stands to grow in LNG and economic development because it's got the, the potential to benefit from its democratic dividend, which has got the youngest population of any uh, uh, continent, I mean, continent in the world. It's got the new gas fines, the coordinated infrastructure development, especially the LNG import terminals, uh, in particular the offshore based ones like FNGs and FSRUs, they stand to, to benefit Africa. There are also increased efforts towards intra Africa trade 
with institutional strengthening and human capital development, as well as uh, enhancing uh, political uh, uh, stability. With regard to the benefits, uh, the benefits, uh, uh, as, as, as I alluded earlier on, that uh, energy is the lifeblood of, of, of any economy. The, the gas is more efficient and less environmentally harmful and cost effective as a transitional food that will take us forward in terms of uh, moving to renewable energies. In, in, in fact, the International Energy Agency has dubbed this era that we have just entered as what they, they see as a potential gold, uh, golden era for, for gas. There is also improved access to electricity, which will then translate to improve uh, standards of living and economic growth and development. Uh, the mitigation of environmental degradation and concomitant global warming, which poses a threat to the globe, uh, uh, allows Africa to then move on a low uh, carbon uh, growth trajectory than using the current fuels. Um, and then there is also a, a, an issue of saying that uh, we, we Africa still needs to put more effort, uh, a coordinated effort, at national as well as regional and continental integration. I will stop at that, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amuzi. Listeners, giving you a global LNG market and Africa's position is our next guest. Aldworth, uh, please take over the slides and give your opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Albert from DNG Energy. We are passionate about LNG because of the prospects of what it uh, it proposes. Everyone is has the consensus of saying that Africa is the last frontier province in the world. If you look at my uh, next page and you look at uh, Africa from space versus the rest of the world. You see that Africa indeed is a very dark continent. I mean, as the previous speaker has said, we are poised to have the largest population in the world uh, in the short future, yet we are one of the least developed continents. And without no power, it means that you can't grow an economy it means that there are no jobs. It means that you cannot beneficiate the resources that you have. It means that you can't industrialize. If you can't industrialize, you can't employ the massive young population that is on the rise. And that leaves only one or one of the best solutions that you have is to use LNG. Um, in order to power the continent or to be used in direct industrial applications in order to set Africa on a good growth trajectory. And that will form part of the Climate Act in terms of reducing carbon emissions while achieving high growth rates. Another thing that uh, the world is going to have to live up to is if you look at the carbon emissions of the very computer that you're using right now to say how much carbon emissions did this machine emit before it landed on a desk and the reason why i'm asking that question is shipping plays a pivotal role on how we conduct our day-to-day -day lives and reducing carbon emissions in the shipping industry, which is one of the biggest emitters, is extremely important. Africa, if you look at it, especially the Cape of uh, Good Hope, has over 57,000 vessels that uh, passes through it. And the bulk of those vessels are using uh, fuels that are high in sulfur and that are not climate friendly. And as a result, if we were to move into a scenario where we provide LNG bunkering services around the South African or the Cape of Good Hope area, it would uh, mean that Africa as a continent is contributing or playing its part in terms of consuming gas 
but becoming an international player in terms of being a service provider to the marine industry. And lastly, I want to talk about social growth. In order for people to realize their full potential, it means that they need to have a set satisfactory jobs, it means that they need to have adequate security, and it means that they need to have a decent quality life. And the only way you can do that is if you have energy and it is being deployed in the right places. And LNG, we believe, is that fuel that allows us to achieve that objective. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aldrith. Now for a focus on uh, downstream gas and challenges faced by African gas exporting companies. Mohammed, please present your opening statement. Great, thank you. Well, I just want to share uh, three quick uh, observations. I think the, the previous speakers have done a very good job of laying out both the opportunities inherent in LNG, the technology, um, and the challenges in the African market. So I, I have the luxury in my work of having advised at least a dozen countries around the world on their strategies for the import of LNG, the use of LNG uh, as a fuel source, primarily for power, as other speakers have mentioned, but also for industrial inputs, uh, the transport fuel and the, and the marine uh, and the trucking space. And we're even starting to see it used um, as a combination for off-grid energy, where you have hybrid systems that use both LNG and sometimes solar or wind uh, and more remote areas. So we're seeing the use cases and the opportunities for LNG deployment in the downstream multiplying across the world. But there continues to be a challenge in the African space, and I just want to share uh, three observations. The first is, on this slide, you'll see uh, an overview uh, of the current LNG market, you know, the commoditization of LNG around the world. And there's, there's a few things you should take away from it. The story is still very much the same as it has been for the last 20 years. Europe uh, is a large LNG consumer, although their demand uh, is plateauing. Um, you have what they call the legacy consumers in Asia, Japan, Korea, where their demand is also plateauing. And then you've seen a fall for LNG demand in the U.S. because we've switched from being uh, an importer of gas to being an exporter of gas uh, as a result of the shale gas revolution. The new stories in the LNG space, and this is really where I think the story of Africa as a gas player is going to be written, is in the new sources of demand. You see a huge spike for demand uh, of natural gas in Southeast Asia uh, and in South Asia. Uh, we're working with you know, at least a dozen countries in that part of the world right now on, on plans for building import terminals. You see ongoing demand in Europe, even though it's stabilizing, you know, the, the demand there uh, continues to be robust. You see demand in China. Uh, and India. Um, unfortunately, if you look at this map, while there are demand centers outlined uh, in Europe, Asia, Latin America, et cetera, Africa is still primarily thought of as an exporter in the gas space. The demand potential in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular still remains exactly that, it's potential. There have been very few cases of actual deployment uh, of, of gas utilization um, in the African market. I mean, if anything, the countries that are using gas are the countries that have gas, and there hasn't been an effective entrant uh, of most African countries into the, the market as consumers, at least non-native consumers of natural gas. And, and on the second slide, I'll show you why that, that's such a tragedy. If you look at the map of the world today, and you look at where LNG is being shipped, you know, from the U.S., from the Middle East, from Australia, Africa sits right in the middle of the most attractive you know, routes for natural gas. I mean, the gas is flowing all around Africa, to Europe, to South Asia, to Latin America, et cetera. And if, the, if Africa is able to, and if specifically African countries are able to develop the use cases, again, for power, transportation, et cetera, for that demand, they will have the advantage of having access to most of the world's well-priced natural gas in the form of LNG. So it could be, African gas that's being exported to African countries. It could be LNG being imported from the U.S., from Australia. The advantage here is, is that once the infrastructure is in place, you have liquidity. You have the opportunity in Africa to actually be a player that can borrow from multiple sources to get price competition, uh, to get demand stability, and uh, to work rather well. So 
the outlook is rather positive that if we can develop the downstream market in sub-Saharan Africa, that the sources of gas are, are right now they're available in nearby markets around the world and they eventually will be available from African exporters like Mozambique, uh, Ghana, uh, and Senegal. And then one last point to make, and I think this is really the most relevant. There is an opportunity here for Africa to do what it has done so well in so many other sections, which is to skip an entire generation of infrastructure. You know, I think most people around the world who haven't had the pleasure uh, of visiting, you know, some of the biggest markets uh, in Africa don't realize how far ahead Africa is in some ways. That they, they've skipped building phone lines by building, you know, uh, wireless communication networks and mobile payment systems. Uh, and now, as opposed to the old process in the U.S. and Europe and elsewhere, of building these very, very long uh, and expensive uh, and sometimes environmentally impactful natural gas pipelines through LNG, which is a portable commodity. It can go in a boat, it can go in a barge, it can go in a truck. Uh, we even have, we're starting to put in ISO standardized containers in the U.S. and just putting it you know, on the back of a ship. Because of the portability and the flexibility of LNG as a technology, African countries can skip building basic pipeline infrastructure and instead use LNG as their new mode of distributing energy in the form of natural gas. If you look at the slide, it shows that at a certain price point, and more importantly, over a certain distance, LNG is actually the cheapest option for delivering natural gas. That pipelines do make a lot of sense over shorter distances, you know, in the 1,000 to 2,000, even 3,000 kilometer range, depending upon whether it's an offshore or an onshore pipeline. But once you get into these long distances, and, and Africa is a huge continent, of course, once you get over the long distances, LNG becomes the cheapest mode of actually delivering natural gas. And so to pull that all together is that you have a potential for Africa to be an exporter, but also an importer in the gas space. LNG may be the best technology for capitalizing on that potential and taking advantage of the geographic proximity that both, you know, East and West Africa have to some of the biggest gas producers and consumers in the world. And finally, on a pure cost basis, if we're talking about building the future energy market in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the best way to deliver energy access and quality of energy stability uh, you know, to African consumers, LNG as a technology provides an opportunity for African governments to avoid expensive infrastructure uh, and deliver both plentiful gas at a, at a reasonable price at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Listeners, thank you also for taking the survey question, what is the biggest challenge in growing Africa's gas to power market? We will cover the survey results later on during the webinar. Um, so our guests will now respond to some of the questions that you have posed when registering for the webinar, as well as the live questions that are coming through. My first question goes to Muzi. How can African countries benefit from LNG to power to develop their economy and increase the national GDP? Uh, th thank you. Um, I think the, the first part, as I indicated earlier on, we're looking at uh, proper planning. Um, let's start with that. One of the things that I've also noted, having been involved also in multilateral uh, structures in the in the in in SADC is that uh, sometimes countries they they hold back hoping for 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 for, for the the multilateral uh, uh, body to to assist in bringing uh, policies and plans and then take back on that. I think a country must just aggressively go ahead and then refine it or or fine tune it with the input from those multilateral structures. For example, in South Africa, we just recently uh, uh, approved a, a, an integrated uh, resource plan, which already provides for the supply of um, uh, LNG uh, to, to then um, uh, use it to generate electricity. That on its own will, will, will go a long way to, to, to assist me. We have also, I think also the, the aggressive um, uh, exploration for, for, for gas in terms of having an enabling environment, uh, legally as well as regulatory. It, it, it helps because if there's certainty, it then provides a platform also for players to know that there's security of chain, 
they know that they will get the the returns that are commensurate with the, with the risk taken, and that will then assist. And then the, the, the next thing is the integration at regional level in terms of fast simulation, on a, enabling cross-border trade, which requires the infrastructure, which in turn requires a, a stable environment and the harmonization of, of uh, the legal and regulatory framework. Thank you. Thank you so much, Murthy. Aldrith, I have a question for you. Is there any correlation in LNG growth with expected LPG growth? Thank you for the question. The answer is yes. If you look at where the world is going, um, LNG is predominantly methane. Uh, world standards say that methane is over, on average, the acceptable norm is over 85% methane. And LPG is a combination of butane and propane. So taking those two factors into account, one is a cleaner fossil fuel and the other one is a problematic fossil fuel. So even if on a price parity perspective they were at the same price, LNG would trump LPG at any day from a climate responsibility uh, point of view. Secondly, uh, butane and propane, which is LPG, come from a refining uh, process and generally it is not available in abundance to the same level as LNG is available today, which means that from a pricing perspective, LNG is much more competitive. And now answering your question, the answer is yes. As LNG consumption increases, you will see that um, LPG consumption will start declining. So that's my answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aldrith. Mohammed, uh, we have a question uh, from the audience in terms of your presentation that you just delivered. What is meant by the comment uh, in the first slide that TTF and NBP are used as indicators for LNG pricing? Sure, I mean, I can answer that very quickly. So TTF is the Dutch hub price, NBP is the, the UK um, gas hub price. And, and the best way to answer that is to say that what we have now uh, around the world because of the multiple importers uh, in Europe uh, and the growing set of importers in, in uh, both new and legacy importers in Asia, we have increasing price discovery in the LNG market. We have more data where we can use as smart consumers to figure out what the real price uh, of this commodity is. So I think if you're sitting around the world today and you're asking not just is LNG the right technology for me, but is it good value, you have a way now of seeing the delivered price uh, of LNG around the world and really seeing market trends, which you can use as a government to plan long-term price projections so you're not subject to you know, a high amount of volatility. So it's a smarter LNG market today because of those hub prices than we've had for a long time. Thank you so much for explaining that. Mohammed. Uh, I have another question for you, and that is around your opinion as to which would be a bigger market to play in Africa, LPG or LNG? Sure, it's a great question. I mean, we often talk about in the, you know, the regulatory and policy space about LPG being a precursor to LNG. So I would say that LPG is today's market play. It's, it's, the, it's the commodity that you can deliver right now that has immediate consumers because of its use you know, um, in, in home cooking, but also sometimes in transportation. Uh, and then LNG is being tomorrow's fuel. Uh, and the great thing about the relationship between LPG and LNG, and I think, you know, Aldworth did a good job of explaining the technical differences, at a regulatory level, they're actually very similar in terms of their import infrastructure. You know, LPG terminals, LPG distribution networks, they need to price it and distribute it and market it. And so countries that have the ability to successfully build LPG markets can translate a lot of that experience into the LNG space. And we've even seen uh, in some countries, uh, like Pakistan, for example, where LPG terminals are eventually converted to 
LNG terminals. So I think for anybody who, on the government side who's looking for market opportunities or on the private side who's looking for input opportunities, LPG may be a lower capital intensive option to get into the market today. And if successful, can lay the foundation for building the physical and regulatory infrastructure for an LNG market down the road. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Pradipta, I have a, a question to you, which is specific around Nigeria market. The question is, is Nigeria too late with LNG T7? USA is now a large exporter, not importer of LNG. Europe demand is flat or declining. There are continuing supply overhangs. Therefore, will Nigeria struggle to find a market in Atlantic Basin for LNG T7 gas? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, look, uh, that is correct, uh, because globally, LNG is in a state of oversupply currently, and uh, as per predictions, uh, this will continue for another four or five years. So, therefore, uh, uh, Nigeria will struggle to sell LNG in Atlantic Basin, and in Atlantic Basin, major competition will come from low-priced U.S. Uh, shale gas, uh, that is being produced there. So uh, really, uh, Nigeria would like to would would need to uh, look at other African countries which doesn't have LNG or uh, Asia Pacific, Australia to find markets for the T7. Thank you so much, Pradipta. Aldworth, a question around what is the continent's position on clean maritime in respect to the use of LNG with the move to have bunkering services to be able to serve LNG fuel chips in the not too far future? Well, that's an exciting question. Um, it actually has a, a lot of facets to it. First and foremost, IMO 2020, it is not, it's something that does not really leave a choice to every country that receives a vessel in its shores. It is a regulation that says, come 1 January 2020, all shipping, uh, anything that is a maritime vessel needs to consume uh, fuel which has a sulfur content to that that is less than 0.5 percent, and that means that countries need to oblige to that regulation. However, countries on the continent can use that as an opportunity of saying that um, let us promote LNG bunkering as a way of adding our ability to develop gas markets in our various economies. So it actually means that um, Africa for the first time can play a lead role rather than playing a catch-up role when it comes to something new that is being implemented the world over. As we know, the new regulation is called a once-in-a-generation uh, change in legislation. So instead of taking a reactive stance, I think that um, governments should take a proactive uh, should take a proactive approach. However, I would like to caution against that uh, in terms of now answering it differently to say that it becomes an opportunity for private sector because we know that uh, governments create an enabling environment. However, people in the private sector who are focused on the energy space, you take this opportunity and use it as a golden opportunity to become significant energy players on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aldous. Listeners, I just want to remind you that we do have a slight delay on the line, so please be patient. Pradipta, I have another question for you, also looking at the future. What are the biggest challenges facing Africa's gas industry now or in five to ten year horizon? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the one of the largest consumers of gas is the power generating sector. Uh, and 
uh, you know, investment in the power sector in uh, sub-Saharan Africa is uh, not adequate, and the power sector in most of the countries is uh, really struggling. Uh, they have not uh, been able to commercialize the sector the way it should, should have been done. So if the power generating sector does not take off, uh, gas consumption will uh, continue to struggle. Um, it's actually a chicken and egg because uh, uh, you know the power sector will say that until the gas is not available to us, we are not able to use it. Um, the second factor, uh, the biggest challenge uh, is growth and expansion of the industries. Um, yes, Africa is growing. Uh, generally, Africa is growing, but there have been hiccups and few larger uh, uh, economies like uh, Nigeria, for example, uh, where the growth uh, was a bit uh, altered. So uh, the industries have to grow, have to expand to absorb the excess of uh, gas that will be available uh, to them. Uh, these are the main biggest challenges I think uh, Africa is facing now and in the next five to ten years horizon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Listeners, I'd like to give the survey results now. The question was currently, what is the biggest challenge in growing Africa's gas-to-power market? 23.8% felt that it is the unavailability of natural gas in adequate quantity. 35.71% felt that it was the currency volatility um, artificially inflating cost of gas use cases, and the majority, 57.14%, felt that it's land rights disputes that, that disrupt development of domestic market infrastructure. Now, continuing with the questions from the audience, I have a question for Muzi. When does a small-scale LNG start becoming viable? Thanks, thanks, man, for the question. The, the, the viability of um, small-scale uh, LNG uh, cannot be easily determined. Um, it, it is, I think, it, it, it's a matter of being able to do a cost-benefit analysis from that uh, point of view. But I, I, I have not, uh, I've noticed that uh, access to infrastructure, importation costs, and shipping requirements um, they are the ones that will actually be the big determinant. But for me, what, what we've seen, let's take, let me take a case of South Africa. We are currently having a, a, a gas to liquid plant that is uh, running very low on gas and uh, at the uh, point of maybe needing this to shut down. We've got uh, gas funds recently um, in the west coast of South Africa at uh, Bupada by Total, um, which are, are bringing some hope. But um, as things stand in, 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 in Africa, you need to have that enter customer to be able to have a gas market. And um, that anchor customer will, by and large, be a gas, a, 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 a gas to power customer, that is for, for power generation. And then it is then that you will then have the reticulation, reticulation to 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 other industries, factories, uh, as well as uh, 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 households. That that for me forms the, the, the because it's all a question of um, economics. You see, which which at what point does the project actually become sustainable? Noting the kind of infrastructure that must be put ahead uh, uh, pre investment in this regard. And, and also noting that this is a capital intensive uh, um, uh, venture. And two, we also, got, as I alluded earlier on, with the issue of availability of capital, most countries being not related uh, um, uh, investor investment grade, that uh, poses a challenge in terms of the, 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 the cost and, and having a viable uh, or bankable project. Thank you. Thank you so much for that response. Mohammed. we have a question around investment. What are the investment drivers for LNG projects in Africa, given competing prospects and projects in other parts of the world? 
Well, yeah, thank you for the question. I and mean, this is this is one of the ones I'm, I'm most excited to talk about. I, I think the, the greatest, you know, driver for the prospect of LNG investment in, in Africa, specifically sub-Saharan Africa, is the scale of the investment opportunity. Most of the LNG projects around the world, most of the LNG import projects around the world have been what I call replacement projects. They've been countries uh, like Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, and now we have new entrants uh, you know, in the Philippines and Vietnam, uh, other countries around the world that have been replacing falling supplies of domestic gas because of depleted fields with imported gas. What does that mean? It means that they have already developed the, the gas transportation infrastructure. They already have the gas-fired power plants. They already have the market. They're just replacing domestic gas with imported LNG. The, the advantage in Sub-Saharan Africa is that you have a fully integrated market that needs to be built. So an investor who has the risk appetite but also has the expertise can build not just the LNG import facility, but can build the transportation you know, network and actually the power plant as well. And so this possibility for integrated power plants which are very attractive for investors because they have end-to-end -end control, right? They, they're not just selling gas, they're actually selling power at the end of the day. That scale of investment opportunity is not present in many parts of the world. That's the, the greatest advantage that I think Africa has. And I'll say one last thing, because I think, you know, Muzi had a great point. When it comes to credit quality, in a lot of these markets, the gas import, you know, the national, you know, petroleum company, whoever the gas importer would be, has a very low credit quality, and they're, they're a difficult customer for gas. However, Power markets are improving in Sub-Saharan Africa, and utilities are improving, and they're becoming more creditworthy by the day. You know, we see improvements uh, in places like Kenya uh, and elsewhere. And so maybe at the end of the day that what you're actually doing is buying gas-fired power instead of buying gas. And I think the advantage that you might see in some, some parts of, of Sub-Saharan Africa is that the stronger financial position of the power utilities may actually be the perfect anchor customer uh, for the, the, you know, the capital-intensive LNG infrastructure that needs to be built. So I think scale uh, and just, you know, the sheer size of demand is the best opportunity that Africa has to, to, to offer to the market. Thank you. Um, Aldred, uh, we have a question around transportation. How does the transportation sector, especially sea transport, position itself to contribute to the realization of this laudable objective? It is an easy, it, it's, it takes collective effort. If as a collective we really believe that we need to move into a cleaner generation, we just need to do fuel switching. If one person does fuel switching and more and more people move towards uh, switching to a cleaner fuel, which is LNG, not only will it uh, help a lot of African countries with the sources of natural gas that can be converted into LNG, it will increase its tradability, it will increase its uh, viability, and it will only become a positive win for everyone involved. So it is just that collective effort of fuel switching. Thank you. Mohammed, the next question goes to you. Is there a financing risk of stranded infrastructure given the impetus for climate change based um, on divestment from fossil fuel commodities? Uh, sure, it's a fair question, and it's a question we, we encounter quite often. I would say it's actually quite the opposite. I think the rise and the penetration of renewables, especially intermittent renewables like wind and solar, is actually driving greater gas demand because together – they actually form the perfect pairing for the new, you know, energy base load that the world needs. So we're actually seeing gas replacing coal in the U.S., uh, and you're seeing gas because of its flexibility, the ability of gas power plants to cycle up and down, uh, and even LNG seasonality. You can get shipments more in the summer when you need air conditioning power and less in the winter, perhaps, when energy demand is lower. That the flexibility of gas actually partners rather well with the new sources of renewable power. And I think even in sub-Saharan Africa, Actually, South Africa has done a great study as part of the IRB showing that the lowest cost power at the end of the day is actually a pairing of imported LNG, which is a bit expensive, and low cost solar and wind. And that can effectively replace the coal base load and other base load that they have right now. So, yes, I think you could overbuild gas infrastructure to the point where it may start becoming non-competitive with some of the new sources of power. But if you're smart about it and you, and you do good energy demand studies and you really map out your daily and seasonal demand, gas actually pairs very well uh, with renewable energy and forms sort of 
I think the, the most viable way forward and, and it's part of the decarbonization efforts uh, around the world. Thank you so much, Mohammed. Pradipta, is the chance of a robust and standardized gas hub taking off in the West African gas corridor soon? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think there is. There is a robust and standardized gas hub taking off in West Africa uh, because uh, you have you already have major uh, players like Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, uh, and you, uh, the new gas finds in Senegal, Cameroon uh, is happening. So um, uh, there is a chance uh, of a robust or sanitized gas hub. Uh, the uh, and and the, the countries should be working together. There is already a economic. Uh, 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 sort of organization called the ECOWAS, which is which already has the uh, so pa parameter set up to to be, have a uh, gas hub coming up in West Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Murthy. With regards to the availability of skilled staff in South Africa and Mozambique, what are the main challenges being faced by companies looking to mobilize staff? for upcoming projects. Yeah, I think generally in South Africa, uh, looking at our history, uh, the kind of education that was in place, um, we, we still have a backlog in terms of getting to the right level of skills in most of the key uh, sectors. And uh, finding that um, uh, you, you still find that there are jobs, but uh, some is the problem of people not being uh, skilled uh, for that part, for, for, the, for what the industry needs the most. I, I would say that um, it, it's not really, there's no silver bullet to dealing with issues of skills, but um, I take it as a, a, a lot of effort that um, come from different angles aimed at, at resolving the problem. We do have a, a skills development strategy um, and other documents that the government has put in place to try to assist the education system must also come in handy. I think one of the key things that is important is the industry being able also to talk to the institutions, uh, those institutions so they can develop um, the kind of uh, a student that will be able to to be of value to the market and start at, a, at, at an early age. You will note that even in the city, um, when you go there to various departments, those are named after certain industry teams, most of them, especially in the engineering field. So so that, that then becomes important. Also getting the, the, the state-owned entities uh, to be well run and managed will go a long way because those, they also serve as um, the right platform for capacitating various individuals because their mandate is not solely to look at the bottom line, but um, to also play um, a socioeconomic uh, development uh, uh, um, role. I, I would also um, uh, dare to say that um, in, in the issue of localization comes up again and again, wherever you go yeah, to in Africa, uh, where sometimes it's not uh, handled in, a, in the best way, where if you, put a, a, you look at your locality, then you expand to the next uh, country and you look at the next um, uh, the, the, the region, uh, instead of only looking at the country and then uh, trying to export uh, skills, uh, to import skills, I mean. So for me, it's important that let's say we're developing something uh, in Mozambique. The the the, the, the uh, discovery is that uh, um, uh, um, greater than 100 TCF, and then it's for us, uh, we've also partnered with them in terms of, of the gas commission. I was uh, at one stage a gas commissioner myself in our relationship with Mozambique. So those relationships also uh, help, and then. Um, Getting people to go overseas to learn, because if a project happens once in a while, it wouldn't help really to go to town, uh, to great lands, to develop skills that will then, after that, speak idly. So there's a, there, there are a lot of issues 
to consider the uh, partnering between the private and public sector in the development of those skills, uh, as well as also in the international relations part of, of, I mean, like, program of the country for skills development to be ingrained there. That becomes very much important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Muzi. Elspeth, uh, a question around an anchor client. Uh, once an anchor client is supplied, like Kucha, how do virtual pipelines take LNG to the rest of the country? You've got a few options in terms of um, how you can do that. Uh, our colleagues at Greenville in Nigeria, I think, are doing some of that work already where you, from a storage facility, you can fill up a road tanker, uh, which on average can take 60 cubic meters of gas, which is around about 30 tons of gas, take it to your customer, where your customer would have to put up a re-gas infrastructure for them to be able to consume the gas. That is option number one. Another option is let's use Guha specifically. You can use it as a hub for the region where you fill up ISO containers which carry lesser volumes of gas but are more versatile, meaning that you can put it on a rail flatbed and you can rail it in large volumes. We know that uh, the, south of, the southern dev, uh, the southern uh, development community, which is SADC, um, has an integrated rail network, meaning that you can rail your LNG from there all the way to Kolwezi in southern DRC. It opens up a very big market for you. The second one is that you can put LNG and take it to the nearby countries. Uh, you can take it to Namibia, you can take it to the islands of Rodrigues, Mauritius, etc., etc., and use the base as a hub for distributed LNG in the region in order to compete with some of the higher uh, costed fuels such as diesel, uh, petrol, and displace those for the use of cleaner energy. So that is how you can use it as a virtual uh, pipeline network. Thank you so much. My next question goes to Pradipta. Uh, does small, smaller scale gasification equipment exist to let local CNI clients make use of LNG individually? Um, uh, no, Nicolette, I'm afraid uh, that such equipment do not exist at the moment. Everything is being imported. Uh, you, the storage tanks, the vaporizers, even the pipes and the valves are being imported. Uh, flow meters are being imported. So, uh, so what, uh, ideally people like uh, suppliers of LNG, like what Greenville does, for example, is get all these equipments, we have all these equipments in our, uh, this thing, and we give it to uh, the customers uh, at a cost or, or part of the contract or whatever. That's how it's done. But locally, no, these are not available right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, an insightful discussion, and I trust that everyone has enjoyed the hour with us. But before we close off, I'd like to ask each of our guest speakers to give their last thoughts or final statements uh, for the audience, starting with you, Pradipta. Um, uh, yes, uh, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, we will... Uh, uh, you know, LNG is going to really boost the growth, economic growth uh, of uh, Africa. Uh, most of the countries depend so heavily on imported diesel, fuel oils. Uh, some countries are using coal, which is not environment friendly. So, given uh, every, uh, everything, I think LNG is going to really uh, transform the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Muzi, what are your final thoughts for the audience? Uh, 
uh, uh, thank you. Um, I, for, for me, I think um, at the end of the day, the LNG projects, um, they need to be bankable at individual level. And we know the challenges of infrastructure because LNG kind of reaches the gap between those who have, LNG, who have gas and those who don't. But at the same time, there must be investment that go into an, uh, the, the infrastructure uh, that will then enable the, the use of the gas. Uh, and mainly uh, power um, generation still remains the anchor customer, notwithstanding that then we go to use LNG for trans in the transport sector uh, uh, as well as uh, to the, the circulation to, to households. But uh, the other issue that we need to, be, to do is that um, we need to, to keep engaging on these matters, particularly when one looks at the fact that LNG uh, gas, uh, good as it is compared to other fossil fuels, it is positioned as a transitional fuel. And then so a complete discussion actually will then entail also uh, looking further at the uh, renewable, noting the radiation that we have in the country in terms of photovoltaic and the possibility that how things will look going forward if challenges that pertain to storage of energy are, are, are resolved. Uh, look at um, issues of electric, electric vehicles also coming into play. All those things together, they then mean that there should be uh, energy planning at the center of everything. To then have that at government participating and cooperating with the private sector to enable and create a conducive environment for investment to ensue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Albert, a very short closing statement from you, please. Africa should not expect to copy um, how the rest of the world developed their LNG story. We need to be creative in terms of how we develop our infrastructure in order to our unique set of challenges that we have and have the confidence that we can do it because the market is there and it is waiting for uh, whoever is willing to do Thank you. Mohammed, lastly, your closing statement. Yeah, I would just say again that I think, uh, as other speakers have said, the opportunity for LNG in Africa is tremendous because of the scale of the demand uh, and because of the new geography. And I would just say this I think, in the same way that Africa has defined new uses for telecommunications, uh, has defined new uses for decentralized power. I think it will define the new use of LNG as decentralized fuel uh, in the modern world. And it's going to be a leader, not a follower at the end of the day. Wonderful. Thank you. My thanks to our guest speakers for giving of their time and knowledge and to you, our listeners, for tuning in to the webinar brought to you by ESI Africa and Future Energy Nigeria, taking place on the 12th to the 13th of November in Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you and goodbye.